Uh, the question is really, in a strategic thinking environment, do commissions really work? It is my position, obviously, that I don't think commissions really work, and so I'm going to try to convince you today that that's true. Um, the question now comes up, why do we like sales commissions? They use them everywhere. They use them in every event. They use them in your household. They use them at your workplace. Uh, we're always trying to incent. Uh, we pay kids to do well on the soccer team. Um, I was with a parent the other day, and they wanted to tell me eight different ways their child gets, played, gets paid for playing football. It was an amazing thing to watch. I'm not sure what we're teaching the child, but we're surely teaching them to chase money. Um, so let's talk about uh, the different reasons why I believe people like sales commissions. One is that it is a motivational item. Uh, we should pay for performance. If we pay for performance, they'll sell more. That's the belief we have. I would suggest that that's probably not true, but that's the belief we have going in. It does drive company priorities. The commissions would vary depending on the product. So if I have a very important product I want to sell, I raise the commission and our belief is, is that the sales force will unanimously decide that they want to sell that product over another. And again, I'll tell you that that may not be true. The third is that the salesperson has the freedom and control of their destiny. I hear this from salespeople more than I do from sales managers or owners, but it's the belief that I can make as much as I want. The more I sell, the more I make. Again, I will tell you that's probably not true, and I can give you some examples probably that you can see and you probably have lived where that's not true. The other thing is to stay competitive in the workplace. I always like this one. Everybody else in our market pays commission, so we have to pay commission. I hear this repeatedly in the marketplace. There are some industries, however, it's difficult to break this model, but in most industries we can. And the last reason I believe we like sales commissions is that it's a, con a cost control measure. I don't have to pay the commission, I don't have to pay the person until he makes the sales. We get paid, they get paid. Look how easy that cash control works. So it's very simple, five basic reasons that are all logical, it all kind of makes sense. There's people all around the world that get paid lots of money to create compensation systems that make it this as complicated as possible and to trick the entire sales force. That's what we do, okay? Because what a sales force will begin to do is spend time learning the commission structure. And they'll figure it out. So what companies do is about every three months they change the commission program so that we have to keep figuring it out. What I'm suggesting is that we're really not feeding the real motivation. In Maslow's hierarchy of needs, there's really three levels that I base my presentation on. One is the survival mode, one is a needs mode, and one is a wants mode. Okay? In survival mode, obviously money is a high motivator. If I have to feed myself, put a roof over my head, commissions will work every time, all the time. Okay? Guy on the street corner, I will work for food. I've never seen him work for food, but he'll take the money to work for food. Okay? He will do just about anything you ask him to if he truly needs the food and he'll do it for money. When we get to the needs level, okay, I need my wife to be proud of me, that's a need. So yes, it will have a motivation, but not as high as survival. And then there's the want part. I want a yacht in my driveway, I guess. Um, money, again, is a low motivator, low motivator. It's something that would be nice, but not necessary. So this kind of kills the idea that the more I sell, the more I make, because really what happens is, I'll sell as much as I need to. I may even get to where I want to, but not to the level that the person who implemented the program really wants. Um, I'm going to give some credit to Frederick Harrisburg. Uh He did a lot of studies on what satisfies employees. employees. And these are the five satisfiers. Um, one is the understanding of my job. The other one is the necessary resources to excel. The third is getting regular feedback. And you could say that a commission plan is regular feedback. If you do well, you get paid. That's pretty quick. Okay. Um, I have to get a career growth opportunity. And the fifth one is I have to have a value that's bigger than my job, an intrinsic value. None of these say money. You could say that a commission is regular feedback. But what he's really saying is that if we work on these five motivators or satisfiers, we will e immensely win in performance, satisfaction, and motivation. So we look at Salesforce performance, and I separate the Salesforce into five categories. There's the new guy. We just hired him. He's a trainee. We have high hopes. 
this person's going to get it. We're going to give him some time to get in there. He's probably not going to have a real commission plan yet. He's going to be paid a little bit to learn a lot. The person he's learning from is going to get his commissions. There's all this whole game that happens around the commissions. Okay? What he really spends his first 90 days doing is understanding how the commissions work, not how to sell the product. He needs to learn how to make the money he wants to make. And we teach him to do that. We actually put him in front of people that will spend lots of time explaining to them how to work around the commission system. The second level is underachievers. Okay? Generally, when I go into a corporation and I look at their sales force and I talk to the sales managers, it's a 60-20-20. That means 20% of the sales force are high achievers, 20% are underachievers, and 60% are in the middle. And what we typically do is we carry them all instead of replacing the underachievers and moving the middle group up. By keeping them all, some of the middle group actually move down. Third group is they meet quota. That's that middle group. Okay? We wish they performed better, but they're meeting the quota. So we leave them alone. It's ringing dollars in. The next one has promise. There's a little cut of people that are performing well, typically because they're striving for wants, not needs. Right? And then there's the peak performers. The peak performers is always an interesting group. Most companies that I deal with are in a love-hate relationship with peak performers. They bring in overwhelmingly the lion's share of sales. And they're the biggest management problem they have in an organization. Okay? They're mavericks. They love to do things and anything they want to do outside what you want them to do. And the excuse they give you is, and you've trained them to give you this excuse, I don't make money doing that. You pay me to sell. I'm going to go do sales. So they don't show up for sales meetings. They don't mentor their peers. They don't represent the organization well. What they're worried about is the pocket, and you've trained them to do that by having a commission structure. So let's, call, let's look at what the commission behaviors of commissions really, what commission behaviors really occur. One is we have non-sales time. So what happens is the salesperson makes a decision on what's the best use of my time. That decision is not made on what sales I can make today. It's what's happening in my life. Would I rather go out for a three-hour lunch or would I rather do a sale? Would I rather do cold calling, which we know salespeople hate to do, or would I rather make an excuse and say I don't need it this month, I've met my quota? There's lots of reasons, right? And there is a tremendous amount of time spent on calculating commissions. I've estimated about 22% of a salesperson's time and the person who divvies up the money is spent on calculating and checking commissions. If there is one mistake in a salesperson's commissions, they'll never trust you ever again. So they will spend lots of time recalculating every time you give it. So that's 22% of their time is spent on nine sales, and that's not what you hired them to do. Second is we do poor customer service. The reason we do that is because we sell the product to the customer that I make the most money on, not necessarily the product the customer really needs. And we've trained them to do that. We actually tweak the commission plan so that they will actually sell to the customer the product that they don't really need, okay? A good story, a very close relative of mine was a car salesman, and he just started selling uh, cars. And in the automobile industry, they want you to sell a car as quickly as possible so you get one under your belt. They'll almost give it away. So just to let you know if you're buying a car, go out and find the newest salesperson on the sales force. You probably get a good deal. So he sold his first car, he was very excited, and he sold like six cars in the first month, which is great. Sales manager calls him and says, um, we have a little problem with your sales. He says, what's the matter? He says, well, you have an option. And by the way, options is where salespeople make money. And the option that was on there was called an engine block heater. Now, if anybody knows what an engine block heater is, and by the way, this sale was made in Baltimore, okay? An engine block heater is you plug your engine into the wall socket of your house to heat it up before you turn it on. It's sold in Alaska. So they said to him, why did you sell engine block heaters in Baltimore? He said, I make $189 on them, that's why. Okay, So you had to call them all back and say, listen, you really shouldn't have bought an engine block heater. Okay? So that's where we have poor customer service. There is no I in team. So rather than um, turning over a sale when it's appropriate, or rather than helping an associate, or rather than coming to sales meetings, I'm going to do all those selfish things that feed my pocket. Now, we know and we've seen excellent salespeople, that top-notch group, okay, They do those kinds of things from time to time. 
because they make superior income is typically why. But while I'm looking at feeding my needs, I'm not helping anybody else. I'm not spending any time on any non-sales event and truly not helping the team. Commission scheming, I love this. Okay? There's sandbagging that occurs. Those of you that have sold before, you know you've done it. I've done it. And there's carry forward. That means that as I'm hitting my quota at the end of the month, if I'm not going to hit it, I'll hold the sales back and carry them forward to the next month. Okay? So I can hit my quota next month. Or if I have achieved my quota, I won't take the last eight sales and close them out this month. I'll move them into next month. Okay? So um, anybody who has had a salesperson who has said this, that I've been in the top, sa- I've met my quota 11 months in a row, he's sandbagging, he's carrying forward. I promise you he's doing it. It's not possible to do it otherwise. Okay? The other thing that is done, this is interesting, is called sales partnering. So I'm selling and you're selling. I'm not meeting my quota, so I give you my sales, and we split the money in a back room after it's received. Okay? So there's all these things going on around, working around the commission stru- structure. Mediocre, prefo- mediocre performance. Um, I sell to my current financial need. You can tell someone you wanted to sell all day long unless someone's calling up and saying, I want to order it. They're only going to sell to their financial need. Second is they stop selling halfway through the commission cycle. If I know it's not possible to get paid a commission, I'll stop and wait till the end of the month. What do I need to do it for? It doesn't feed my pocket, even though the company wants me to. Okay? And the third thing is when I go on vacation or I take time off, it's a killer. I make no money. So during that month, it's the lowest performance month. We believe that July is the lowest performance month in sales because it's the summer nobody buys. It's because commission people go on vacation. That's the real reason. Okay? Last thing is lazy sales management. Now, when I go in corporations and I tell managers they're lazy, I'm not a really nice friend at that particular moment in time. So what happens in a commission structure is they have this feeling they do not need to spend any time with their salespeople because if they sell, they make money. If they don't sell, it's not a problem for mine. They do quick hires and hope we finally get a good person. So there's a lot of turnover or a lot of retention of inferior performing people. So this is what we really get from a commission structure. So what if we could create a system that obtains high sales performance, returns high employee satisfaction, responds to three out of five employee satisfiers, assures positive salesperson response to sales and non-sales behaviors, like we all show up at a meeting and we share, okay? Promotes team sales effort, that means we're turning over, we know that there are certain people that can sell to certain demographics. We ought to take advantage of it. But if the commission structure doesn't have me do that, I'm not going to be incented to do it. Focus sales on the customer. It's about service. And it requires sales managers to collaborate with sales team members on the processes that will likely result in the desired results. What I'm saying is that sales management should be about the processes of making sales, not the results. The reality is is the salesperson really doesn't control results. They only control process. So why do we only measure results? The issue of how many calls I made, how many meetings I have, the method in which I deliver my sales, that's the part that we can really manage. If the salesperson doesn't set the price, they can't control results. If the salesperson doesn't control service, they can't control results. If I have a business that has a bad reputation and I say go sell, it's going to be a very difficult process. Okay? So how do we do this? First, we change the paradigm and system of measure. So we change the measurement from results to process. Okay? Second, we abandon results-based rewards, which are commissions. Third, we collaborate with each salesperson to determine the processes that they control that will achieve the desired results. They're not the same. Each salesperson has a unique talent set, has a unique skill, and the processes that they need to work on are going to be different. When we cookie cutter a sales team, we create a sales team of robots, and we'll get the 60, 20, 20 every single time. Develop a set of measures for these processes. Evaluate performance against these measures measures regularly and fine-tune. Adjust the process, prioritize the effort and reward high performers, coach underachievers, and eliminate low performers quickly.
So, should we switch to the commission? I'm going to tell you yes. That's why I'm up here. It works most every time. I'm using the word most because there are certain industries that are so entrenched in commission, it's difficult to break the mold. Saturn tried to do with automobiles. What they accomplished was they had a market shift. Women preferred to buy in a non-commission structure. Okay? So they did get a shift, but men didn't want to buy there. So right now, more than 50% of the Saturn dealerships are on a commission structure. There are some that still remain in a non-commission structure, and that's where women demographics are high. Okay? Second, the math is interesting. I get from owners that they always want to, they're always afraid, because here's how we implement the switch. I go to a salesperson, I say, how much did you earn in commissions last year? And he says, $150,000. And I say, congratulations, that's now your salary. And the owner freaks out. <laughs> okay? And I say, don't panic, it's okay, because there's no reason to believe that performance will go down. And we're managing the process. We're collaborating. So even if it doesn't go down, it's going to go down for a very short period of time. And I will tell you this overwhelmingly is successful, and every owner is scared to death. Absolutely scared to death to do it. Okay? But it's interesting math, because when we pay commissions, we pay real time. You sell today, I pay you today. Well, in a performance-based program, I set your salary to last year's performance, and then you perform all year. And typically, sales performers increase performance. And what they say to me is, well, wait a minute, if I sell more, should I get paid more? And I say, absolutely. At the end of the year, we're going to do a salary review, and if you've earned the right to make more money in your salary, you'll get that salary. So now I've now pushed the money forward. I'm no longer paying it today. I'm paying it 12 months from now. So it's actually cheaper to implement a commission instruction than it is a commission structure. Okay? Any changes causes turnover. No matter what you do when you implement it, it will turn over staff. There's nothing you can do about it. And you've got to jump off the cliff. You've got to take a chance. It's difficult. I get a lot of trust from my clients. I give them a little push. They jump, and we go for it. And the last thing is the train is coming. The gentleman who runs Manpower, which is the largest employer in the world, made a comment that said that we are about to hit a very different change in the workplace. And that is that we will have more jobs than people to fill them. If we don't shift this paradigm, the skilled salesperson won't exist. We've got to start mentoring them, coaching them for these jobs. Consider the possibilities. Thank you.